Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at an experimental British service pistol from the very end of World War II. This is a Tarn pistol. It was manufactured in 1944-1945. It was actually tested by the British. Not very well, though. So, uh, this was developed by a Polish expat by the name of Bakanowski, and in fact there were a number of Polish uh, basically exiled uh, Polish firearms designers who came to the UK during World War II to continue their work, and they're responsible for some really cool stuff. Um, it was in fact Poles who were responsible for the EM1 and the EM2 rifles. Uh, however, those were mechanically really complex, fascinating rifles that came very close to being adopted. The Tarn here is a simple blowback 9mm semi-auto that did not come anywhere close to being adopted. So let's take a closer look at it. Uh, we'll compare it to a 1911 for size, and then, thanks to Edward Dazelle, I actually have some of the text of the British Trials Report. From the outside this is a pretty simple, uh, pretty basic looking pistol. There are not very many markings on it, none of them on this side in fact. Over here on the left side we will see the serial number on both the slide and the frame. This is number 108. They started I believe at 101, and they only made about 10 of these. Uh, interestingly, more than half of those are currently known in the United States. It appears that after the war uh, the majority of them actually came over to the US. Now we also have the uh, name of the gun, the Tarn. I have no idea what that stands for, or, uh, or is an abbreviation for, or I don't know where that name came from, unfortunately. Uh, and the caliber, which is 9mm. This is standard 9mm Parabellum. We have a heel magazine release down here with a single stack magazine. Now this has eight witness holes, plus you'd have a cartridge here at the top, which in theory suggests nine rounds. However, I can guarantee you the spring and the follower will not compress far enough to allow this witness to hold to have a cartridge in it. I, uh, I would be willing to bet that this holds eight rounds, actually. Mechanically speaking, the gun is striker fired, um, and as I said, simple blowback has a very heavy uh, spring in it and a pretty heavy slide. The whole gun is really quite uh, quite dense. You pick this up and you're thinking you're going to get something like a 1911, and it's actually rather heavier. Uh, it does lock open. We have a slide release back here, which doubles as the safety. Um, roughly doubles as the safety. For size comparison, here is an early 1911. Uh, basically the same size, a little bit straighter grip uh, in the Tarn, and the Tarn is in fact a little bit heavier because it is simple blowback and there's a lot more mass in the slide to accommodate that. For reasons that you will hear in just a moment, I am not going to disassemble this because it is apparently a nightmare to get back together. However, I expect that the disassembly method would be taking out this screw, removing this lug, or this block from the slide, then you can probably pull the slide back slightly, lift it up, and pull it off of the frame. Um, some of these did actually have real sights, this one just has a, uh, a trough sight. Um, presumably because it is just a trials gun and they didn't bother to spend a lot of energy making fancy sights for it. Now I mentioned that Edward Ezell has the text of some of the British Trials report, and I figured I'd read a little bit of that to you. Um, they manufactured ten of these, and then Ezell uh, quotes from an April 1945 report that four samples of the pistol were submitted for examination. Uh, we'll skip past a little bit. It's a, a simple blowback mechanism, standard 9mm cartridge. Uh, this has resulted in the moving parts being very heavy and supported by an abnormally strong return spring, which is definitely true. Uh, to, to ensure a sufficient breech seal, the return spring is initially compressed about four inches uh, while the moving parts are forward, which means if you take this off, the recoil spring at rest is going to come out to about here, which means that's going to be a nightmare of bendy, kinky spring trying to squish it back into the gun to reassemble. Uh, the British go on to say, quote, there are no novel features in the design. Most of the systems, trigger, disconnect, or striker, etc., being similar to those in existing pistols. The general arrangement of the safety and hammer access is poor, and requires a great deal of care in assembly to ensure that both members are operative. Finish and workmanship on the four samples submitted is extremely poor. The pins securing the barrel are very soft, as are all of the other access pins in the pistol. Manufacture has been simplified by making the breech and top slide as two separate components keyed together by a heavy cotter, cotter pin. 
Uh, this principle can be applied to most of the existing self-loading pistols if required. Then they did actually do some shooting with it. So uh, the British report says, quote, Several rounds were fired to test the action, which was shown to be very violent. Accuracy was of a low standard. The pistol is extremely difficult to recock after a misfire or at the commencement of firing. So uh, I think you can see why the British gave up on this pistol. Uh, after that test uh, it was ditched. Uh, Interestingly, manufacture of the Tarns was actually done by the Swift Rifle Company, the same Swift Rifle Company that was responsible for uh, primarily for manufacturing, well, training rifles uh, in the UK. And I have a previous video on a Swift training rifle. Uh, interestingly, the patents for those training rifle designs were taken out by the same guy who designed the Tarn. Um, there is also a, a very similar pistol to this, called the T-Tar, T-E-T-A-R, that is, looks virtually identical, a little bit of a difference in the slide stop and safety, um, but again patented by the same designer, but those were actually manufactured a little bit earlier in the war by Webley and Scott. Why exactly Webley and Scott didn't manufacture these um, isn't clear, although it would make some sense to me that after they uh, they, they probably took a look at the 32, weren't particularly impressed, and realized that in 9mm the design would have serious issues. Um, but that's just speculative on my part. It's certainly also possible that Bakanowski uh, had no affiliation with Swift uh, when he was working on the 32, and subcontracted it out to Webley and Scott, and then after uh, finding employment with Swift, uh, they produced his 9mm pistol. There are a number of potential possibilities. You know, every country gets some really good guns and some really not so good guns, and this absolutely falls into the category of not so good. But I think at least it's almost as interesting to look at some of the things that fail spectacularly as the ones that succeed spectacularly. So it really gives us an idea for the, the full spectrum of what was being developed and tested uh, at times like the end of World War II. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in more information on guns like this, I have long recommended Edward Ezell's Handguns of the World. Uh, it is a book that covers both the successful designs and the designs like this. Thanks!